All right, we're going to continue this morning with three exciting talks from a mix of academia, biology, machine learning, computer science. Uh, but we'll start off with a talk about NLP in the enterprise. Very delighted uh, to have Claudio Mouchat here. He is a data scientist at the Swisscom AI lab. AI lab. Um, his LinkedIn profile um, says research director. Um, at the Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Group at Swisscom. We're delighted to have him here. We're delighted to have the digital lab uh, of Swisscom here on campus. And so it's a great pleasure to introduce him and to welcome him. Thanks a lot, Claudio. Hello, everyone. First of all, sorry about my voice. Maybe someone can help me with the viruses around. Um, for people who've lived in Switzerland and or who've been visiting for more than a few days, you might wonder what Swisscom is doing here. Because the image of Swisscom normally is a very nice people and very nice shops that help you if you have a problem with your phone. And when I say phone, I mean phone. <laughs> because that's what Swisscom used to be, like a phone company that's been uh, around for like forever, 100 years or more, and that's where they were stuck. Until things started changing rapidly, because while they were making 400 million francs out of SMSs alone, that just went poof, all gone. <laughs> As a consumer, I'm very happy about that, like very happy. But for Swisscom, that was just the beginning of a major problem. The revenue went down from 9 billion uh, Swiss francs out of the phone uh, area to 2 billion right now. To have that sort of a drop in revenue and not go bankrupt is an achievement. They've managed, and I say they because that happened well before I joined, they managed to steer the ship around, and it's a big ship. And one of the major courses that they chose was to cater to enterprises. Now, enterprises have lots and lots of needs. And now I'm going to go back to the title, the original title of the presentation, which is Natural Language Processing in the Enterprise. Things that have to do with natural language are well, prevalent in most businesses. You need to interact with consumers, you need to understand what they're saying. And this is what my lab is doing. Okay, so before we actually say what we want to do and what we're doing, let me start off with why. Okay? What do people expect of us when we say we provide natural language services? A first use case is to figure out if something went wrong. Now normally if you look at a timeline like that, you don't really, sorry, I need to stop moving around. Ha, I'll just use the mouse, I hope you can see it. Um, you don't need a lot of intelligence to process a timeline. Okay, you just find the peak and then you're done. But the problem is defining the signal, okay? Maybe you're not just talking about the occurrence of a keyword. Maybe you're talking about negative sentiment towards a product. Or maybe it's a whole topic that's being discussed, and if you figure out that one product is discussed a lot, you need to know about it. So natural language processing goes into figuring out what the signal is. And then with just a bit more post-processing, ringing some alarm bells if something is off. And after you've identified an incident, first thing you do is make sure you send it to the right person to handle it. Doing that is basically a classification problem. You have multiple teams handling various types of incidents, and you need to route this particular one to the person most competent in solving it. And depending on the parlance you prefer, that would mean extracting features, 
defining properties or whatever, but in the end it's classification of usually text. Connected to that is to predict and to not just wait around and be reactive if you can beforehand figure out that something is going to happen. So if you detected the features of some incident, then when you have lots and lots of data coming in, what if you find that, oh, okay, this actually matches the conditions that were there before the previous incident? And there's a high likelihood of something bad happening in the near future. You get that small time difference that can be very important for your customer, ringing the alarm bell before something bad actually happens. Sometimes it's not obvious how to react when something does happen. And you need to just freeze that moment and take it forward to people to analyze it. Topic modeling is a tool of choice in that case. So you figure out that there's a peak in calls, you do some speech recognition, you transcribe those calls, and then you use LBA, for instance, to get some topics. Does that help? Well, yes and no. Because if you just apply it blindly, you will get some very nice looking word clouds that don't help much. But if you also use some very simple filters like part of speech filters and you combine bigrams, you already get some phrases that make sense and that help people understand what was going on when that peak occurred. So it's just one way of doing analysis, but it's effective. And of course, the data source does not have to be a sequence of data. You don't have to wait for a stream of data in order to extract topics. You can just have a collection of documents that someone gives you. And by gives, I say, I mean, uh, either using an API call or uh, a colleague giving you a coffee and uh, a disk, whatever, you can have a document collection and then some topic extraction that will help that person understand more of the data he gave you. This is actually a, a true story. Two months ago, we had an employee survey, and then the person running the employee survey came to us saying, I have to read 10,000 items right now. I don't want to kill myself. Okay, help me. And what we provided was basically the list of the topics and of the actions that people mentioned the most. Turns out that that's exactly what the person wanted. We also gave them uh, some tag clouds for the presentations, less useful. Okay. So about, that was basically about classification and topic extraction, but going a bit deeper into why people use all these tools, agent onboarding is a great use case. Probably everyone here has called customer support for whatever enterprise at least once. I'm not sure how many people were actually happy with the result. Usually, there is a very high turnover for support agents which means that when you first call, if you have a problem which is not very obvious, like change my password or my computer crashed, then that person needs to have lots of knowledge in order to serve you. And if they've just been hired and put through two weeks of training, well, it's difficult for them. It's very difficult to have all this knowledge to give you the right answer during a phone call. So they will probably need to take to forward your call and then you wait and you talk to a more knowledgeable person and all this takes time and it costs a lot. So how do we give more knowledge 
to these people who have just been onboarded. We can predict a solution for a given ticket automatically. Think of key value pairs. Okay, someone mentions a problem, and this is the incident. So you want to find a similar incident and show the solution to the agent to see whether or not that would be effective for the client. It's not rocket science, but it does help the agents a lot because instead of being completely blind, they at least have an idea of what has been done to solve problems in the past that resemble the current problem. Yeah. A connected use case is sentiment analysis. And although this is probably very hard to read, I just put this slide up there to show that we can make very nice photos. <laughs> it's, Took me a moment to appreciate this. Oh, wow, okay, that's the actual image of the product. But in order to read it more easily, um, it's again about timelines. Everyone I know has an opinion, anyone that works in the field has an opinion on what sentiment analysis is and how it should be done and whether or not document level sentiment analysis makes any sense, meaning extracting an opinion from an overall document, or if, even if sentiment for a phrase actually has any meaning. Some people just think, okay, you need to have sentiment about a given thing. That would be aspect-based sentiment. Now, we, we withhold judgment. There are many ways of extracting useful data for a client that fall under this large umbrella of sentiment. You can have document level, phrase level, or very targeted sentiment about something specific. But once you aggregate this, and you put it on a timeline, and you make the connection with a product or a service, this becomes the signal that was in the, in the first slide that you can then track and report incidents on, or use whatever in whatever way. This is the signal that's most important for the client. I thought a lot about putting on this slide. Um, we don't have this. Okay? This is like the holy grail. If we manage to automate the processing of requests from customers, we're basically done. That's, that's as far as we want to go. That's our ambition as Swisscom's AI lab. We're pretty far from that. But we do have tools that get us a part of the way. There's still manual intervention needed. For instance, you could do it by using templates. But if you need people to generate those templates, then that's costly. But even finding out that this is, an, uh, this is about time and this is about someone, or this is an action, these are chunks that we call enablers that are still useful in driving down the costs of the analysis. Because in the end, that's, all, that's what this is all about. Reducing the manual work to drive down the cost. If anyone has any ideas on how to do this quickly and efficiently, please talk to us. Okay, so I've mentioned enablers. These are bits of the stack we're offering. And stack mm -hmm. looks like this. We have a perception layer and a reasoning layer. For the perception, we can get data from customers. They have an API call, um, and we get, for instance, a collection of documents that we then process. Or we ingest public data, or we use our own data in order to bootstrap uh, an analysis. This can be, for now, this is just text and metadata, but in the future, near future, I hope, it will also include speech. And once we have the data, the next step is extracting 
relevant information about it. Entities and topics were among the first choices. Because in the end, you need to know what the data is about in order to say something. <laughs> Keywords are, well, a simpler version of topics. You can just use an inverted index, so solar elastic search, to have a very quick view. If you need extremely fast analysis, that is sometimes the way to go. And then I've already mentioned sentiment. And using this bits of information, you can anonymize, you can detect trends, you can flag incidents, raise alarms, and so on. You can also summarize. Right now, we're not summarizing document collections, although this is on the roadmap. We're summarizing trends. So we're giving a bite-sized piece of information about everything that's been going on, sorry, um, with that customer's data. And at the end, you can give out all these services either as a solution for many, just open the API, a solution for one, if you don't want to uh, interact with the API directly, we can build a product on top of the stack and create something made specifically for you. Or if that's also cumbersome, just give us some data or tell us what kind of data you'd be interested in and we'll get it ourselves and then offer insights by running all this. It's basically a matter of how much time and effort a client can invest and we do the rest. More visually, it looks like this. So instead of having all those enablers as a list, it's, more, it's easier to see them here. For instance, if we're talking about Swisscom and Swisscom TV, you can find various keywords and topics as a list. You can see the positive, negative, or all the sentiment about these on a timeline. You can see some named entities that have to do with Swisscom or Swisscom TV, and finally you can summarize the trend. This is called Sonar. This is a product which is gonna be launched soon, so this is like a preview. And um, it's a showcase of what our stack can do. We're not done. Um, we're far from being done. We want to improve the algorithms, but as the previous speaker uh, mentioned, the data is very important. So we, we're trying to get it, our hands on as much useful data as possible. These two directions are too big for a team of right now four data scientists to process. We're growing, we're gonna be seven in, a few in two months, but still, um, some people here from larger um, companies might say, what, seven, no zeros after that? Yeah. But there's, uh, there's a way to achieve more without doing everything in house, and that's by collaborating. And we have open collaborations with EDIUP and EPFL to great local institutions. With EDIUP, we're working on speech to text, speech analysis, and on machine translation. These are two of the strengths of the Institute in Martini. If you don't know about EDIUP, Google them, they're great. And with EPFL, for now we started with a few master theses to get to know each other. Hopefully next year we're gonna have a larger collaboration with all the professors that are here today, for instance. 
I can't really disclose a lot of what we're planning to do or started doing. But what I can say is that with EDIAP, it's all about the Swiss aspect of natural language. Switzerland is peculiar. It's a small country. It's very under-resourced linguistically. And it has more dialects, dialects than I can count. They don't even know how many dialects they have. That makes it a hard problem. And for speech analysis, it gets worse. What we're trying to do now with EDIAP is first to figure out how people speak high German with their Swiss accent, and then moving from that to the actual dialect. On the translation side, I think we're among the first to consider this as an actual problem, translating between Swiss German and German. That's what my boss said. I mean, are, are you kidding? That, <laughs> no, it's uh, for real. That's, we're, we're doing this. It's not obvious. So if, if you just look for um, the name for uh, Zurich Lake, you'll find at least five different ways of writing it. It's not a simple thing. And if you want to then map all those five different versions to the high German one and do it with a high accuracy, then you really have to look into this problem very seriously. Okay, um, the first master thesis that we proposed was about extracting key phrases. There's been a ton of research on this. Um, so, first of all, what are key phrases? Um, key phrases are face forms that appear a lot or carry a lot of meaning in a document collection. So, for instance, here, if you think of all these squares as n-grams, you would want to extract that these three cues, because they appear a lot, they're important. And there are many methods of doing it. However, few of these methods employ the latest advancements in word embeddings. And embeddings have been proven to be the secret sauce in many uh, NLP applications. So why not here? And this is the question we're trying to answer. How can we create better embeddings to get better key phrases? A second direction is aspect-based sentiment analysis. If you have a phrase like happy scientists program in PowerPoint, I've been doing that a lot lately. Um, and you have the um, begin inside and outside notation biotex here, then you would want to see that, okay, scientists is actually an aspect. There is an opinion about that somewhere in the text. And what you want is to get a feature representation that will take this information and help you find various similar contexts where aspects are mentioned, well, similarly. But most of those features usually have to do with word sequences. And while sequences carry a lot of meaning, it's not always enough. Sometimes you can get a lot more if you also look at the phrase structure. If you Take a look at how the tree of that phrase looks. I haven't seen a lot of research on this, but again, if you can pitch in, would be glad to hear from you. For named entities, and when I say named entities, right now I'm just thinking of the classic um, types like locations and persons, um, organizations. 
There was a very nice project about a decade ago called Wikiner. And what they've done is to create weekly supervised models for detecting named entities by using the information in Wikipedia. And I really believe that's a great idea because getting the labels you need to create good named entity models, that's the tricky and that's the costly part. So if you could just use Wikipedia, that would be great. Problem with that is that, well, whereas if you can find relevant information like, okay, Zurich is probably a location because it contains a map or it contains some uh, keywords there like uh, city. It's very difficult to apply that to Swiss languages. We're getting back to that same problem. There are ways of using the Alemannic Wikipedia to extract information about Zürichsee, uh, Zürichsee, or so on. Just that people haven't been looking very seriously at this, and we're trying to do that. And finally, and I'm just gonna go very briefly over this, chatbots have been getting a lot of attention lately, and for good reason, because wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be nice if this actually worked? Um, we have a great advantage as Swisscom that we have data and that the domain is very limited. And we're trying to build three types of bots, like FAQs, retrieval-based bots, and ones that can access memory, and finally, ones that are personalized. We're really not sure about the third one. This is an open invitation. If you're working on these topics and you want to work with us, we have quality data and we also already have some ideas. And that's it. Thank you. Questions? Just yell, I can't see, I'm blinded. very much for the talk. Um, so it seems that you are missing a, I'm here. Yeah. Um, you're missing a very important component which is the social aspect of uh, the whole enterprise. Um, basically for example you have different people working on different problems and nowadays it's very common that uh, you give them opportunity to help each other. So in a sense making a social network of um, interactive agents or customers or whatever there are. Are you thinking about uh, adding this sort of tools to people for, for people to use and improve their experience, or you're only thinking of the uh, old-fashioned kind of uh, hierarchies that people are only people and they don't have any interaction with each other? That's a tough question because it has so many answers. Um, we are looking at the social aspect from a community building perspective. So for instance, if you want to do topic analysis and you manage to separate the communities that discuss different things, then you have better odds of improving the topic analysis itself. But then if you're talking about creating recommendations for different communities, that we have not yet done. I come from, I have a recommendation uh, background, so I feel the pain that I have not uh, mentioned communities at all in this uh, presentation, but that has to come on top of something. And until we actually build a stack of, well, lower level enablers, we felt that we couldn't look properly into the social aspect. But we acknowledge the importance of the, the topic. He's on? Okay. Thanks for the talk. I was wondering, so you mentioned the peak in calls and the sentiment modeling. 
and then you came to the use case on Swisscom TV and Fernbedienung, and I was wondering all the while how you deal with Swiss German. And then in the end, you mentioned that this is the current, what you're going to look at with EDIAP. So this means you focus on a subset of data currently that is actually in high German for your, where you can apply, where you have more of a linguistic help, so to say. Or how do you deal with this in a way, in, in a, if you have Swiss company, enterprise client um, calls, or anything else in sentiment analysis? So I'm going to separate the two sides of the problem here, the sentiment analysis and the speech recognition. In order to get this, the transcription of what people try to say during that phone call, we actually have a huge advantage in the fact that Swiss people know that they shouldn't expect others to understand heavy dialects. That means that they usually make the effort when they call a hotline to speak high German. That makes the problem easier because we just have to look for accented high German and not the dialect. In most cases, sometimes you don't get lucky. So that being said, if you have a sentiment model for high German and the speech recognition works for accented high German, it's problem solved. If you manage to create a model for the dialect, then indeed you would have to create a sentiment model for that dialect or go through a translation phase. We picked option number two. That's basically why we're translating everything into high German. All right, thanks very much. I think in the interest of time, we have to move on, but uh, Claudia will be around for some time. Thanks very much again.